When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? <laughs> Where the place? There to meet with Macbeth. <laughs> Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees. And welcome to a brand new Teacup for One series which I am calling Shakespeare Fan Theories. I'm aiming to do one of these a month. It might be more, it might be less, we'll see. Now, this is the thing about Shakespeare. Shakespeare gets a bad reputation because yes, the language is complicated and People are usually introduced to Shakespeare in high school where, more often than not, the material isn't being taught properly. It's not being taught in a way where people can understand and appreciate the characters, the text, or even the story. In addition, there is a pretty prominent community of Shakespeare snobs that really give the work a bad name. You know the types, the people who literally worship William, the ones who believe that only they truly understand his intentions and they will strike you down if you dare disagree with them. And if you think I'm over exaggerating, just go look at the comments section on my Loki is Edmund from King Lear video. You will see. But all that is to say that I think there's this unfortunate stigma that Shakespeare is only for the scholars. This assumption that you can't love Shakespeare and also love, say, for example, Marvel. I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still really hung up on that 10 paragraph long comment on the Loki is Edmund video. But I realized something recently. One of the big reasons that I love pop culture is the same reason that I love Shakespeare the fan theories. When there's a book or a movie or a TV show that I love, I am one of those people that will just dive straight into the fan theories. I love looking for, you know, the Easter eggs and the clues that suggest what could possibly be coming next. And I feel like fan theories really thrive on two things, clues and context. Clues involve a little bit more sleuthing. So that's when you're on the lookout in your movie or TV show of choice, just for some kind of visual Easter egg or any Easter egg in general that you can use to build your theory around. We saw a lot of that earlier this year with WandaVision. There were so many visual Easter eggs littered throughout that show that people latched onto to form a ton of fan theories. Some of them amounted to absolutely nothing, hashtag Mephisto, but some of them were right on the money. Probably most obviously was people figuring out that Agnes was actually Agatha Harkness and the clues were there all along. <laughs> It was Agatha all along. It was things like her name being an obvious elision of Agatha and Harkness, and Agnes, her rabbit being named Senior Scratchy, that was relevant apparently, and then there was the visual clue of Agnes always wearing a brooch no matter what era she was existing in, and a brooch was one of the signature pieces of Agatha Harkness in the comics. So there you go, clues were left, fans connected the dots, and it made them better understand the story. And they were right. As for context fan theories, these are fan theories that just plant a seed asking what if, and that what if question suggests an entire unspoken backstory that can completely change a narrative. Some of my favorite examples of context-based fan theories include Padme being secretly in love with Obi-Wan in the Star Wars prequels, or James Bond being a code name that's been used by generations of different spies over the years. And there are some fan theories that use clues and context hand in hand. The best example, and the most popular example, is the fan theory that broke the internet a few years ago. The Pixar theory. And that one is still going. And all of that imagination and attention to detail that feeds into creating fan theories is also at the root of appreciating Shakespeare. This is something that I learned when I was studying Shakespeare as an actor, but it applies to anyone and everyone who is looking to read and understand the plays. The genius of Shakespeare is that he will drop the clues and then leave the context up to the actor slash reader slash interpreter to connect the dots. What I love about Shakespeare is that we are never going to have a clear answer on what his intentions were because he's dead. So no, fellow Shakespearean actors, you do not know why he utilized an irregular meter for to be or not to be. That is the quest. 
Jun. All you have is your interpretation and your ego, so please take a seat. That is really the key to making Shakespeare less pretentious, just looking at all these interpretations of the text by actors, directors, scholars, what have you, as an endless cycle of fan theories. So that is the focus of this brand new series, looking at Shakespeare fan theories and how they can completely change the meaning of a play. And we're going to kick things off with one of the most famous Shakespeare fan theories from one of the most infamous Shakespearean tragedies. Macbeth. Yeah, I'm not scared to say it. Macbeth is a fascinating play, and no, not just because some people think it's cursed, that is another video for another day. But one of the cool things about Macbeth is that it's one of the only Shakespeare plays where we see a couple in a healthy, functional marriage. Okay, maybe healthy is not the right word, but functional marriage. And I'm not joking, they do terrible things, but they do them together. And the two of them perfectly balance each other's strengths and weaknesses. The relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Macbeth is the heart of the play, and there is so much room to interpret the exact dynamic of that relationship. In fact, there is a single line in Macbeth that literally changes every production of the play. It is a clue that forces actors and directors to make very solid decisions about the context, the relationship, and the history between the Macbeths. And that line is, Ahem, I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. Okay, uh, quick translation. I have breastfed a baby, and I was a good mother. But I'm also a woman of my word. And if I made a promise to bash the baby's brains out, I would bash the baby's brains out. You made a promise to me and to yourself to kill the king. So, kill the king. And when people hear this, they generally have one thought. Well, I, they technically probably have two thoughts. The first is, wow, that's graphic. But then the next thought is, I would like to see the baby. There is no other mention at any point in the play of Little Macbeth Jr. And in fact, that line is really just a throwaway line. The scene isn't about that. But the fact that that line is there suggests a much bigger story. Because it's telling us that Lady Macbeth, in her lifetime, has given birth but we never see a child. And in fact, later on in the play, Macduff even outright says that Macbeth has no children. He has no children! It's usually like that. As far as I'm concerned, there are two possible interpretations. Either the Macbeths lost a child, or Lady Macbeth lost a child. And I know that sounds like the same thing, but there's a key difference. Either Macbeth was the father, or Lady Macbeth had a child from a previous marriage. And I'll admit that at first, I didn't think that argument had very much merit, just considering that this play was written in the 1600s and all the stigmas that were surrounding divorce and second marriages, but according to my labor-intensive Wikipedia research, that is historically accurate. Like, that's what actually happened. Macbeth is classified as a tragedy, but it is loosely based on the real-life history of the Scottish king, Macbeth, who took the throne of Scotland in the year 1040. Real-life Macbeth was married to a woman named Gruach, but he was actually her second husband. Gruach was originally married to a Scottish lord, and she did have a son with him. Now, eventually, that Scottish lord was killed quite violently. Possibly at the hands of Macbeth, but who's to say? And Gruach ended up marrying her late husband's cousin. Macbeth. It's very Richard III. Now, in real life, Gruach's son ended up living a full life, and he even took the throne of Scotland after Macbeth's death. But that's as far as I read on the Wikipedia page. The big takeaway here is that there is a case to be made for Lady Macbeth having had a child with another man in a previous marriage. And if that's the case... There's a lot to unpack there, especially when you take into account the power dynamic between the two characters. Could this potentially mean that Lady Macbeth is older than Macbeth? Could she be past childbearing age and therefore unable to give Macbeth an heir? 
that could explain why she is so heavily invested in helping him get the crown. The mentality of, well, I couldn't give you an heir, so I'll give you Scotland. Or does it mean that Macbeth is impotent? If he knows that his wife has already had another man's child and he is unable to provide an heir of his own, how does that affect the dynamic of their relationship? It almost flips the narrative so that instead Macbeth is the one who is saying, well, I couldn't give you a baby, so let me give you Scotland. And these are just two possible interpretations if you even choose to believe that Lady Macbeth had a child from a previous marriage. Because of course there is the far more popular interpretation that the Macbeths lost a child before the events of the play. This really seems to be one of the most popular interpretations, especially when it comes to the film adaptations. The Sam Worthington Macbeth film from 2006 and the Michael Fassbender Macbeth film from 2015 both open with a nonverbal sequence showing us Mr. and Mrs. Macbeth mourning their child. And I think this choice makes a lot of sense, especially for film, because the loss of a child is something that is going to instantly resonate with viewers and help humanize the Macbeths and amp up the tragedy before we see them commit a ton of murders. Admittedly, I wasn't sold on this interpretation at first. My first introduction to this fan theory surrounding the Macbeths and their missing child was through the Sam Worthington film. And something just didn't sit right with me about introducing us to this couple through tragedy, as if that was meant to explain or justify all of the serial killing that I knew was about to ensue. But now that I've dug into the text a little bit more, I'm starting to understand how that context truly serves the story. Because Macbeth, the play, is so heavily rooted in themes of children, legacy, and grief. There are references to children and succession throughout the play, but I think it's best expressed by Macbeth's soliloquy in Act 3. So that's shortly after he's been crowned as king and just before he sends the murderers out to kill Banquo. He essentially says that he's found himself between a rock and a hard place. Yes, he's king, but that's pretty much useless unless he can stay king. He's consumed with guilt because he killed King Duncan, but he is also super paranoid that he's going to be dethroned and killed by Banquo's family because that was part of the witch's prophecy, so it really makes him stop and wonder, what was the point? What was the point of killing Duncan when Macbeth knows that he has no heirs, and one way or another, the Macbeth family line is going to end with his death. If we go into the play, Believing that Macbeth has been a father and has lost a child, it really paints this entire soliloquy as that moment in the grieving process when you realize that you can't get back what you've lost. Becoming king didn't get Macbeth his child back, and in fact, it burdened him with a slew of new problems because he's also realizing that he can't go back and undo the murder of his king. It's really just putting him into this downward spiral of grief until eventually he finds himself in over his head. Until he no longer has a head. And that's the tragedy of Macbeth. And that is why Shakespeare fan theories are so fascinating. Because all of these fan theories completely change the meaning of the play. All of these fan theories are valid. And all of these fan theories are rooted in one single line of text. <sighs> and that is why Shakespeare is the king. Anyway, friends, this concludes yet another episode of Teacup 41. Now, let me know in the comment section down below, what do you think? Did Mr. and Mrs. Macbeth have a child? Or is Lady Macbeth talking about a child from a previous marriage? I would love to hear your thoughts. Also, let me know, do you have a personal favorite Shakespeare fan theory that you'd like me to talk about in another episode of this series? Because I'm compiling a list and I love all of them. Now, if you want to be the first to know when I release more videos about Shakespeare or Disney or movies or cats or Funko Pops, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. If you haven't subscribed already, it is super easy. All you have to do is click on my face. Thanks for joining me again today, everyone. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees, and that's the T cup for one. Go away.